that okay? Can you hear me? Yeah. All right. Um, thank you so much to Representative Tara Costa Howard and her team for bringing me back to Illinois and for all of you for coming out tonight to listen to me. The support that I've received from people in this area over the last two weeks has been overwhelming and I'm so grateful for it. It's wonderful to know that there are so many people out there who are valuing diversity, who want to see inclusive schools, and who are willing to speak up for LGBTQ students and LGBTQ equality. When I first started writing, I had no idea that writers visited schools, or that they sometimes had to speak in public. And that was probably just as well. Um, but much to my own surprise, after 10 years, it's become a part of my work that I really enjoy. When I visit schools, one of the things that I always tell kids is that one thing most writers have a lot in common is that we don't get out much. <laughs> so I always tell kids that I spend a lot of time at home with flannel pants, with my dog sitting on my feet, sitting in front of my computer, either buried in research notes or daydreaming about imaginary worlds. So having opportunities to travel and talk with kids about writing and about books is always energizing and inspiring and it's a good reminder of why I do this work in the first place. It's for the kids who are here tonight, it's because there's kids like you out there who read books. So thank you for making it possible to, uh, for me to do work that I love. So seven weeks ago today, I was scheduled to talk about my new book, Kid Activists, at an elementary school in Wheaton. Kid Activists is the newest book in a series called Kid Legends. And these books are collections of biographies about famous people. There's earlier books in the series that I know some of the kids here have read kid athletes, kid scientists, kid artists. This is the first one that I've read. And I was really excited to write it because talking about activism with kids is something that's really important to me. And these biographies are a little bit different than most biographies because although they tell the stories of famous people, they focus on what those people were like as children, in most cases long before they became famous. So I learned a lot writing it. Now, I know there's lots of kids here tonight, and when I speak in schools, I usually kind of get the kids to help me out with my talks. And I don't know how easily I'm going to be able to hear you, but I'm going to try. So, of the kids here, who knows what an activist is? I see a hand. Can you shout it out really loud? Gay rights from working in public schools in California. 
as always, helping, as always, understanding history helps us understand today's challenges. The history that I was taught in school did not include LGBTQ plus people. Our rights and identities were never talked about. I didn't see people like me in books until I was an adult. I didn't come out until after I left high school, and this was true for many people in my generation. Still, I was very lucky. I had very supportive parents who had gay friends. That wasn't the case for many people I knew. And I'm still very fortunate. I live in a country where my rights are protected, in a community where my family and I feel very safe and supported. I move in the world with a great deal of privilege, which is why I feel that I should speak up about issues of human rights whenever I have the opportunity to do so. So today, I live with my partner of over 20 years. We have a 15-year-old son. And when he first started school, I told the kindergarten teacher that he had two moms. And she was a very kind woman who very much wanted to be inclusive. So she asked if I could recommend any picture books that she could share with the class when they talked about families, so she could make sure that she was including different types of families in their conversation. And I was able to come up with a couple of titles, but there weren't very many back then. And my kid very rarely saw books like, sorry, very rarely saw families like his in the books that he read. So 10 years later, and almost 30 years after I came out, a lot has changed when it comes to LGBTQ plus representation in books. There are so many fantastic picture books, stories about kids who have two moms or two dads or gay grandparents, kids who are transgender or gender non-conforming, kids who show the reader that it is okay to be whoever you are. There are history books for young readers about Stonewall, about Harvey Milk, about the origin of the rainbow flag and how that began. There are books for middle school kids, books about girls who have crushes on other girls, boys who fall in love with other boys, kids who are figuring out their gender identity and finding their place in the world. Even Rick Riordan's wonderful books now include LGBTQ plus characters. And there are so many teen novels with LGBTQ plus characters that I can no longer keep up. 10 years ago, I had read all of them. Now, I believe there's about 60 coming out in the next couple months. Even I cannot be that. <laughs> so all these books make a huge difference. For kids who are LGBTQ plus themselves or whose families are, they can reduce any sense of isolation that they might feel. They can provide positive, affirming messages about their identity. They can counter negative stereotypes. So for a kid who's growing up, maybe in a family or community, with negative attitudes towards people who are gay or lesbian, a book may be the first place where they see a positive representation. They can normalize different types of families. And some kids have two moms, some have two dads, some live with a grandparent. Some go back and forth between two different houses. There's lots of different ways to be a family, and what matters is that people support and love each other. Books can educate about LGBTQ plus history, identity, and community, and they can offer hope for the future. They can even save lives. But of course, for kids who aren't part of the LGBTQ community, who may not know much about it, these books are equally important. They can help them understand an important human rights issue and they can help them better understand their peers who are part of the LGBTQ plus community. Understanding leads to empathy, which leads to concern for equality and social justice. If you know people who are LGBTQ plus, you're more likely to support equal rights, you're more likely to care about these issues, because you can see that it affects people that you care about. But of course, books can't do any of these things if they don't make their way into the hands of readers. So writers like me count on many librarians, teachers, booksellers, and parents who understand why kids need these books and who put them on the shelves and bring them into the classrooms, even when they worry that these might lead to challenges. And I know there are many of you here tonight, and I appreciate what you do. For 10 years, I worked as a social worker and counselor. A lot of that work was with teens. And then I started writing. And for the first 10 years of my writing career, I wrote novels, I wrote fiction. So, for the younger kids here, fiction means basically I made stuff up. I wrote stories about um, characters that I made up in my head and things that I imagined might happen to them. And I started, some of those books included characters who were gay or lesbian. And I started getting letters from readers who were saying how much it mattered to them to see those characters in books. So I decided I would write a non-fiction book that was more directly about LGBTQ issues. And I'm going to show it to you. It's called Pride, and it came out in 2016, so three years ago. But because of this book, over the last three years, I've had a lot of opportunities to visit schools and talk about the history of Pride, um, LGBTQ plus identities, what Pride celebrations look like, some of the ongoing challenges around the world, uh, and the work that people are doing to continue to fight for freedom and equality. 
quality. The book's aimed at kids aged about 9 to 14, so I've spoken a lot to upper elementary students, middle school students, and high school students. And I've seen the incredible work that's being done by so many teachers and librarians and school administrators to create safer, more inclusive schools. Schools where every child feels seen, accepted, supported, and celebrated for who they are. So it's been a very moving experience and an amazing opportunity, and I'm so impressed with this generation of young people, how aware they are, how compassionate they are, how accepting they are, and there have been some really great moments. At one talk a little while ago, I asked the kids if they knew what all the letters stood for. And they were, they, had, they did a great job. It's L was for lesbian, G was for gay, B for bisexual, T for transgender, and then we got to Q. And they were kind of stuck, and there was a long silence. And then one fifth grader put up her hand and said, I think I know. The Q stands for quality. <laughs> like, yeah, it does now. <laughs> I've written the second edition of this book, which comes out in the spring, um, expanding it and updating it, and I've added a chapter about youth, about youth activism, because I wanted to include some of the stories of the young people that I've met over the last three years in the course of talking about this book. Um, so that one doesn't come out until March, but I'm so excited to be able to share some of these stories of young people, from teenagers in Inuvik who started their community's first pride parade, to kids at elementary schools on the Sunshine Coast who painted rainbow crosswalks at their schools. There's so many young people um, doing amazing work, and I think often it's young people who are really leading the way. So visiting schools has really reinforced my understanding of why talking about these issues is important. After one talk I did in middle school, I got an email from a mom. Her daughter had just come out as a lesbian. When the mom asked her daughter why she had decided to come out now, because she said she'd been thinking about it for a long time, the girl said, we had a speaker at the school today and the talk made me feel brave. So kids need sometimes people to talk about these things to give them permission to talk about them themselves. Another time, at a tiny rural school in the Maritimes, two kids in about grade three or four came running up to me after my talk, and they were so excited, they said, because they had two moms as well. In Quebec, I noticed a girl at the back of the room who was silently crying while I spoke, and I was worried. But at the end, she came up to me and she said she was just crying because she was so happy, because no one had ever talked about this in her school before. And she was in grade 12. So I have so many stories like that, but I just want to share one more. A group of teens had asked me to speak at a Pride conference that they had organized, and I gave a keynote about the history of Pride. And one teen came up to me afterwards, looking actually kind of angry, and she said that she hadn't known any of this. Why don't we learn this in school, she said. Why do we have to come here on the weekend to learn stuff that we should be taught in history? So I think it's so important for young people to know about the hard work of activists who fought for the rights that we have now, the people on whose shoulders we all stand, and whose work today's young activists are carrying forward into the future. For many communities, stories about their religion, their country's uh, family's country of origin, are passed on from generation to generation. But most LGBTQ people do not have parents who are part of the community. And so I think we need to make sure that they have access to this important knowledge. And it's not just important for LGBTQ young people, it's important for all of us, because this is a shared collective history that includes everyone, and it's about human rights. And sometimes we teach about social justice movements directly. So in my Pride book, I try to teach about gay rights and transgender rights in the same way that we might teach about women's suffrage, abolition of slavery, civil rights movement. But sometimes it just means not making LGBTQ people invisible, not erasing them from history. It means including people like Harvey Milk and Janet Mock in books like Kid Activists. And there's evidence to show that it makes a difference. Research shows that LGBTQ students who attend schools with inclusive <coughs> curriculum have a better climate in the school and are more successful academically. In October, I went to Toronto for a GSA conference. GSAs are student clubs. They're gender and sexuality alliances or gay straight alliances. And they're clubs where students can come together for conversation, support, and to work to make their schools more supportive. And this was a one-day conference that had, was hosted by a middle school, but 14 different schools were taking part in it. There was about 150 kids there making buttons, recording podcasts, making posters, sharing displays about projects they had done in their own schools, and networking and socializing with a larger group of, of peers. And it was such a great example of what's possible and of the wonderful work that's happening in so many schools. Now, funnily enough, I had not actually intended to talk about any of these issues in Wheaton, 
Um, I had prepared a PowerPoint talk that focused mainly on racism and on civil rights activism. But Kid Activist was a book that I wanted to write because I'm very much interested in talking about all kinds of social justice with kids. And over the last few years, as we've seen an escalation of racism, white supremacy, attacks on LGBTQ people, attacks on immigrants and refugees, writing has felt increasingly political to me. It's a way that I can share what I learn and what I care about so that other people can also learn more about those subjects. In writing Kid Activist, the first challenge was to come up with a table of contents. So basically deciding who we were going to include in the book. And I knew I wanted it to include a broad range of different types of activism and different social justice movements. So my editor and I talked about many names. I probably could have, we probably had about 50 names and we only could pick 16. So we went back and forth trying to narrow down the list of names. And it was really important to me that that be a diverse group of people. So the people in this book are black, white, Hispanic, South Asian, and indigenous. They're Jewish, Catholic, Baptist, Methodist, Quaker, and Muslim. About half are women, one is disabled, one's gay, one's bisexual, one's transgender. It's diverse, inclusive, and inspiring group of people. And all of them are people who saw things that needed to change and fought to make change happen. I really enjoyed writing it. It was a great excuse to buy stacks of interesting biographies. Um, and it felt like a treasure hunt because I was looking for anecdotes that kids would be able to relate to. So little stories about these people's childhoods that would be moving or amusing or inspiring. Um, I think it's a fun read, I think it will appeal to kids, but I also think it's a really important <coughs> timely topic. And I hope that as well as just being an interesting, fun book to read, that it will also be a good jumping off point for some important conversations. Um, although I had imagined them taking place in classrooms, not in the media. <laughs> but I think for, for teachers, for parents, you know, these stories in this book are ways to introduce topics with kids and have conversations about those topics. And it, one of the things that I have tremendous respect for when I speak with young people is what a strong sense of justice young people have. Kids notice when things are not fair. So thinking about the kids here, here tonight, I'm sure you can all think of a time when something didn't feel fair. And sometimes that might be something really small, like, you know, your brother got a bigger piece of pizza. But sometimes it's a big thing which tells you something about something happening in the world which isn't fair, something that affects a lot of people. And I think that it's important to provide opportunities to talk about those things. Because kids often feel very worried about the things that they hear and see in the news. I know I did when I was a child, and I've spoken to many kids today who have big fears, particularly about climate change, for example. Um, and they can feel powerless to make a difference. And I think even as adults, we all have times where we still feel frightened or powerless, so it's not hard to relate to. But I think for kids, especially when you don't have a larger context for understanding these problems, or a historical perspective that shows you how far we've come with respect to many human rights issues, um, it can be really overwhelming. So I think it's really important for kids to know that all of these people who have done so much to make our world a better place, people who fought to end slavery, fought for civil rights, fought for women's right to vote, for access to education, for gay rights, and more, were once just children. They had fears, they faced bullying, they sometimes got bad marks at school, their parents didn't always understand them. Um, they were ordinary kids at one time. So who knows who Rosa Parks is? Any of the kids out there know? It's really dark from up here. Of 
black citizens in Montgomery, Alabama, refused to ride the buses until that unfair policy got changed. And one of the people who emerged as a civil rights leader during the Montgomery bus boycott was Martin Luther King Jr. But when he was a kid, he was known as Little Mike, and he did not know he was gonna grow up to become an activist. In fact, does anyone know what he wanted to be? A firefighter. Yeah, he wanted to be a firefighter. And he used to play pranks on his piano teacher. He didn't really like taking piano lessons, but his mom said that they had to. So one time, he and his siblings unscrewed the legs on the piano stool, so that when the piano teacher sat down, the piano stool collapsed. So he was a little kid and did little kid things. Now, all the people in this book saw injustice when they were children. So their childhoods, although in many ways they were ordinary kids doing kid things, they also had childhoods where they experienced or witnessed injustice. Both Martin Luther King Jr. and Rosa Parks grew up during a time when segregation was legal in the southern U.S., and they experienced a lot of things that they knew were unfair. When Martin Luther King Jr. was about five, his best friend was a little boy whose parents owned a shop on their street, and this little boy was white, and the two boys used to play together all the time. And when they got to be about five years old and it was time to start school, Martin Luther King Jr. was sent to the school for black children, and his friend was sent to school for white children. And then the other boy's mother said that they couldn't play together anymore. Now Martin Luther King Jr.'s mom told him that this was wrong, that segregation was wrong, and that there was nothing natural about discrimination. She told him that he was as good as anybody else. Rosa Parks had similar experiences of injustice and racism. She only was able to go to school for five months out of the year. The white kids got to go to school for nine months. Black children went to different schools, they used separate bathrooms, they weren't allowed to swim in public pools. But like a little Mike, Rosa Parks also had important role models in her life. Um, Martin Luther King, or little Mike as he was back then, later said that he grew up with a sense of somebodyness, that he grew up with parents who always told him that he mattered. And he saw his father push back against this unjust system. So one time when little Mike and his dad were out shopping for shoes together, the store clerk said they needed to move to the back of the store and sit in the black section. And little Mike's father refused. He said, we will buy our shoes sitting right here, or we will not buy them at all. And after they left the store, he said to his son, I don't care how long I have to live with this unjust system, I will never accept it. And his son grew up to be somebody who changed it. All of the people in this book also had hope for a better future. And that was one of the themes that came up over and over again, that these were people who had a vision for how things could be different and better. You know, and the kids here, any of you guys know about a really famous, famous speech that Martin Luther King Jr. gave? Over here. Yeah. <coughs> the dream speech, that's right. He talked about having a dream and how things could be in the future, how it could be different. And that was something that came up over and over again. Because if you have a dream, if you have hope, if you have a sense, a vision of a different future, um, then you have something to work towards. And I think that that can keep you going during times when change is slow and difficult, because change doesn't always happen quickly. Susan B. Anthony, does anyone know what she was famous for? Yeah. Yeah, the women's suffrage movement, that's right. Back in 1872, she was arrested and fined $100 for voting, because back then women were not allowed to vote. And she spent her life fighting to change that. And it was a very long, very hard battle, and in fact, women didn't vote in a presidential election until 14 years after her death. But she always believed it would happen. And in her very final speech, she said, failure is impossible. So I think it's important to think about hope and how does a vision of a different future keep us going. But I think everybody can probably also think of times when they haven't felt hopeful. Um, and I think that that's an important thing to talk about as well, because it's easy to feel discouraged. And when I was talking about this book with kids in California, it was um, or like in, back in September, and it was like around the same time that Greta Thunberg was speaking at the United Nations, and so the kids were reading about her. And one of the things she said that really stuck with me was that when you don't have, and I'm, I didn't write it down, and now I'm going to mess up her words, and she said it much better than me. Um, but she said, instead of looking for hope, look for action.
action. And when you act, hope is everywhere. I think that's such an important message as well, that when you're working for change, there's going to be days when you don't feel hopeful, but you can still take action. And when you take action, that connects you with other people who share your goals, who share your passion, and that can um, help you feel hopeful again and it can bring about change. Now, so these activists in this book started out as ordinary kids, and one of the things that I hope is that that makes them more relatable, and that that helps kids see that they too can grow up to change the world. But I didn't want to send the message that you have to wait until you're grown up before you can change the world, because there are in fact so many young people who are doing incredible work right now. So the last chapter of the book is about people who became activists when they were still kids themselves. And I ended the book with a chapter about an indigenous <coughs> teenager called Autumn Pelche, who's been speaking up to protect the water since she was just eight years old. And she says, anyone can do this work. If we all come together, we can make a big difference. I think one of the things that I hope that this book can do as well is to help kids understand history. So many people have fought so incredibly hard for the rights that we have now. And I think it's important for all of us, kids and adults, to know the history of the civil rights movement, the suffrage movement, the women's rights movement, the gay rights movement, the transgender rights movement. I have such a strong appreciation for the work that has got us so far, and I have so much respect for the young people who are continuing this fight for social justice and taking it forward into the future and continuing to challenge all forms of oppression and to shape our world. I think it helps when current problems feel overwhelming to know that people have faced really big problems in the past and that when it comes to human rights, yes, there's still a lot of work to do, but great progress has been made and I think it's important to recognize that as well. So although this book touches on some tough issues, I think it's ultimately a hopeful book. It's about people who face challenges, who went through difficult times, and who stood up for what they thought was right. And I hope it will inspire young readers to do the same. And I'm just going to read you a few pages from the chapter about Harvey Milk. Harvey Milk, coming out for equality. Harvey Milk was a gay rights activist and one of the first openly gay politicians to be elected to office in the United States. He won a seat on the San Francisco Board of Supervisors in 1977, but was assassinated only a year later. He grew up in an era when gay people had no rights at all and his fight for equality made him a hero to many in the LGBTQ plus community. Harvey was born in 1930, between the two world wars. His father, Bill, was in the Navy during World War I, and his mother, Minerva, signed up for the Women's Naval Reserves. After the war, they both settled in New York, where they married and had two sons, Harvey and his older brother, Bob. When he was eight or nine years old, Harvey would spend his weekly allowance on tickets to go to the movie matinees on Saturday afternoons. He and Bob would go to watch The Lone Ranger, Hopalong Cassidy, or The Three Stooges, but it wasn't actually the movies themselves that Harvey looked forward to all week. Before the film began, the theater manager held a raffle, and whoever had the winning ticket would go up on the stage to collect their prize. A Buck Rogers toy pistol, perhaps, or a Hopalong Cassidy wristwatch. For Harvey, the real prize was the chance to run onto the stage and bow to the audience. He loved to be in the spotlight. Harvey's family, sorry. Harvey's family was Jewish, and his grandfather Morris had helped found the Sons of Israel Synagogue. Harvey's dad and his uncles all worked for Morris and were members of the synagogue. Harvey loved his grandfather and wanted to please him, so he never spoke critically of religion. Later in life, though, he said that by age 12, he had decided that religion was hypocritical. Secretly, he started to reject his family's religious beliefs, and Biggie was always proud to be Jewish. When Harvey was 11 years old, he discovered something that brought him much joy, opera. The performances of the Metropolitan Opera were broadcast on the radio, so Harvey began to spend Saturday afternoons on an armchair in his living room listening to them. The operas were sung in French, German, or Italian, so he didn't understand the words, but he loved the emotion and the drama. Sometimes he pretended that he was wearing a tuxedo and conducting the orchestra. When he was 14, his mom started giving him money to take the train into New York City to see live performances. In his teens, Harvey started realizing that he was attracted to other boys. But this was long before the gay rights movement began in America. In fact, this was long before the word gay was even in common use. In the 1940s, same-sex relationships were a crime. Gay men were referred to as homosexuals, and Harvey knew what people thought about homosexuals. Even his own mother had warned him to stay away from them. Suggesting that someone might be a homosexual was one of the worst things you could say about them. Harvey knew that this part of himself was something he had to keep secret. So he worked hard to fit in. 
He had a sense of humor that made everyone laugh. He dated girls. He was on the football team. He joined track, wrestling, and basketball. Harvey hung out with the other jocks, but he didn't have any close friends, maybe because he was having to hide something important about himself. Decades later, one of his high school classmates recalled, when we were young people, we didn't know there was such a thing as gayness. If Harvey knew this, he had to face it all by himself. As a children's author, one of the things that I often have to do is figure out how to talk about tough subjects for different age groups. And history is full of terrible events. So in writing this book, I had to talk about slavery, about segregation, about the Holocaust. I had to talk about wars. I had to talk about people being assassinated. And I had to do all of this in a way that was truthful, but also sensitive to the young age of the readers. And those subjects were hard to write. But talking about people being gay or bisexual or transgender was not difficult at all. It wasn't difficult because those things are not bad in any way. Those things are, are normal. And I think there's no age that's too young to begin having these conversations. In fact, I wrote a board book for ages zero to two. It's called Pride Colors. And I wrote it because despite all the progress that's been made, I still hear from kids who are afraid to come out, afraid that if they come out as gay or bi, or lesbian, or transgender, or non-binary, <coughs> that their parents won't support them, or will be angry, or will be disappointed. And those are heartbreaking stories to hear. Kids need to hear from the people that love them that it is okay for them to be themselves and to love who they love. And they need to hear that message from the time they're very small. So I wrote a new book about pride for the youngest babies and toddlers, and I realized that you are all just a little bit outside that age range, but I'm gonna read this book to you anyway. <laughs> And it's the book that I kind of wished I had when my own kid was a baby. A bright red heart, I don't know if you can see it at all, but a bright red heart, a little star, I love you just the way you are. <coughs> Puddles an orange, a snuggle, a snooze, be yourself, love who you choose. Yellow sunshine, smile so bright, I'll hug you, kiss you, Hold you tight. Soft green grass, cool shady tree. I'll love the person you grow to be. Sky so big, peaceful blue. A whole wide world is here for you. Purple glitter, dancing wild. You are my very precious child. Rainbow flags, pride day fun. I'll always love you, little one. So that's how you write about the Pride Day. <laughs> it's basically the message that I wish every young child could hear and grow up knowing, and it's what I wish every adult I know had heard as a child. And I have a few copies here to give away. Does anyone here have little ones in their life? Anybody here with a baby or toddler? Yeah, so come on up. I have four. Um, <laughs> people want to know if it's going to be a sequel. Um, 
But it's a very, so despite the fact that this is about, you know, serious issues, it's a very gentle story and I think a good introduction to both gay rights and refugee issues for small children. And I'll just read you the first couple pages. Ghost lived in a small apartment on the beautiful island of Java with her two dads. When Rainer played video games, Ghost snuggled by the headphones and purred. When Eka cooked gulai, Ghost stood on her back legs and begged for a taste. When friends came over, Ghost played with everyone. But when strangers came to the door, Rainer and Eka turned off the lights and pretended no one was home. Ghost wanted to help. She fetched some toys to play with. She snuggled close and licked their tears. People don't like us, Ghost, Rainer whispered just because Eka and I love each other. Okay, so if anyone here has a five to eight year old, I've got one copy of this one to give away as well. And this one, <laughs> this one is actually a book that we wrote as a fundraiser. There's an organization called Rainbow Refugee and another called Rainbow Railroad that work to help LGBTQ people around the world who are facing state-sponsored persecution um, and help them to resettle in Canada. Um, and so any money that this book makes from sales will go to support those two organizations. And I have two copies of Pride to give away as well. So if there are any tweens or teens here, say nine or ten and up, or any middle school librarians that want a copy for your school, um, I've got two of these. been so grateful and so really amazed by their response and um, it's been really emotional um, and really moving and really encouraging to see how much support there is out there so I'm really grateful to you all and I'm, I'm happy to take any questions but there was